If you are here, you have taken an active role in bettering your life, no matter what stage of life you are in. The Banyan Treatment Center's podcast will discuss many topics like recovery, addiction, self-help, mental health, and so much more. It will provide you with tools to succeed, ideas for recovering, and how-tos on creating a better life. My name is Alyssa, and today's episode is about hitting rock bottom while at the top with Darren Prince. Aiming High is the astonishing story of sport and celebrity agent Darren Prince, who battled addiction while representing some of the most iconic figures in the world. After a drug overdose, many demoralizing nights and mornings where he couldn't get out of bed without a prescription in hand, Darren hit rock bottom at the top of his game and in the process discovered the true meaning of success. The book demonstrates Darren's remarkable experience as a serial entrepreneur, his rise to the top, and finding his bottom. Today, we'll discuss his inspiring story, how he helps to change the lives of thousands around the world, his efforts to continue making a difference in his community, and encouraging advice for those that can relate to his message. With close to 15 years of sobriety, Darren has a newfound passion to help others break free from their addiction. Thank you so much for joining us today, Darren. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself, what your company does, maybe some of the clients that you work with? Who is Darren Prince? Thanks for having me. I do <laughs> appreciate it. We got this done last minute. <laughs> um, so uh, we could start with the company, I guess. Prince Marketing Group is a sports and entertainment marketing agency. Uh, I've been around for almost 30 years. Uh, clients are Magic Johnson, Chevy Chase, Charlie Sheen, Hulk Hogan, Ric Flair, Carmen Electra, Denise Richards. Uh, there's just a lot. We've been very <laughs> fortunate to work with uh, you know, some of the most iconic figures of all time. But, you know, it's not really why I'm here. Everybody right. gets so mesmerized by it. They think it's name-dropping. It's part of my daily life. It's not. Um, you know, I found my calling through recovery. Mm -hmm. I grew up feelings of uh, less than and adequacy and not feeling comfortable with my own skin and had all the love you would have expected as a child and support from my mom and dad and a lot of friends, but I just always felt broken and not worthy. And I, I started a uh, business at 14 years old, selling baseball cards. But I did have an experience uh, that summer where I was in sleepaway camp. And you know, now I'm making a little bit of money, getting a little bit of that swagger. Mm -hmm. Nobody was doing what I was doing. And I had terrible stomach pains when I, the nurse gave me this green liquid to take away the stomach pain. And mm -hmm. Within two minutes, all those feelings went away. As I'm walking across the softball field, I felt alive. I felt like Superman. Um, everything was numb, and I felt as good as everybody, as popular as everybody, as smart as everybody. And this is coming from somebody that was verbally teased mm -hmm. for you know, having a learning disability, and I just wanted more of that feeling. And every night for three weeks, I went back to that infirmary uh, to get that green liquid that my parents found out was a liquid Demerol. Wow. How old did you say you 14. were? 14. 14. So that was when this officially started yeah. for you. Yep. It's crazy how early it can affect you. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you saying you said that you had um, the sports memorabilia collection, sports cards. What do you think led to your passion and drive into entrepreneurship at such a young age? I think, I think a lot of that was my father, may he rest in peace. He, uh, he would always say that I'm lacking what mostly everybody has. Mm -hmm but there's also some part of my brain that nobody has. And we have to find a way to tap into that. And he was a businessman and um, I was challenged by a teacher one day in class, uh, in June, I, I think it was my 10th year, my sophomore year, uh, everybody was told to go home and create a business overnight. And I actually had one in my mind, <laughs> I just wasn't selling the cards. Yeah. Everything was in beautiful shoe boxes with labels and stickers and it just became more of a hobby and um, my my dad and I discussed having insurance that night on my collection. He thought I was crazy when I told him I had $9,000 worth of cards and how I accumulated so much money worth the cards. And uh, a lot of that was holding odd jobs from squeezing orange juice, delivering newspapers, working at a pizzeria. And I would take all that money and buy my friend's collections because mm -hmm. at that point, you know, cards weren't cool anymore. And I just <laughs> wanted everybody's collection that had value to it. And... Um, so I pulled the newspaper ad out, and I showed him there's this thing called a baseball card show. It's $20 um, for a table, and I could buy, sell, and trade all day. Look, and he thought that was just great execution. He goes, why don't you give it a shot? He goes, this could be a lot of fun. And Steve Simon, who runs my agency to this day, 
we go back since I was 10, we shared the table because it's a $10 wow. investment mm-hmm. by each of us was a big deal <laughs> at that age. And I prepped for two weeks. Every day after school, every night, whatever I had to do to make sure my display was meticulous, everything was at holders with professional signs. And my dad went to typesetting and design company, so they made these beautiful signs of all my stuff. And I made over $1,000 on that Sunday afternoon wow. at 14, and, and that was it. Steve made 50 bucks. He was thrilled because <laughs> he didn't do it for money. He just did it to keep me company and have fun. And um, I was just off to the races after that. That's so amazing. A $10 investment led to a grand <laughs> yeah. at 14 years old. Yeah. So what happened with the liquid Demerol? How did it progress to a full-blown addiction over the years? So, so I, 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 came back, I came back from camp. Uh, my mom and dad were, my mom more so was furious with the, with the nurse. Um, and I had a wisdom tooth surgery about three mm-hmm. months later. So I don't know what these white pills are that my mom gave me. But as I say, when I speak, all the time uh, across the country that one in three kids that take opiates from a dentist to point now become addicts and I yeah. was one of them and uh, these white pills that had a V on them and like a serial number and God that feeling came right back I'm lying in bed I'm picking up the phone I'm calling up everybody I'm loving life I'm the smart one the popular one I got some money now I'm making more money than some of my friends parents so that ego that big shotism is mm-hmm. kicking in and um, there was only like eight pills so that was the problem so when I went downstairs the next morning and saw that there was two left, I was devastated. So I, you know, typical addict in training, I learned how to lie and, and con in that moment. I grabbed my cheek. I put on the crocodile. She said, I Mom, I have a horrible infection. We have to go back and see the dentist. I, I don't know what's going on. And, oh, my God, I'll call the dentist. Are you okay? Are you okay? And take another pill. And <laughs> so I was like... <laughs> There was no pain. Right. And when they got back to the dentist and get more whatever these pills were that I found out that day when I went to see him and he gave my mom more, were extra strength like it. Wow. Now, because of taking those pills, did you experience any sort of withdrawal or? No, just... because I don't think I had them long enough, but yeah. that fuse was lit. Yeah. And, and, and as we say, I chased that feeling for a long time. And then at that point, and I'm 15 years old making probably a hundred thousand dollars a year which is wow. unheard of i'm yeah. getting notoriety now i'm getting rent up in the usa today the new york daily news new york times uh, as this baseball card maven and so now you can't stop me right so i'm going on the streets and i'm buying percocets and whatever it is and then recreational drugs started coming in from everything from ecstasy cocaine and I was the one with the money by the time 16 rolled around, 17 with fake IDs and, you know, you know buying, you know, alcohol, whatever you got to get from the liquor store. But I was the one with the money and not feeling validated at all. And I was having that brokenness. I wanted as many people to be around me as possible. All the friendships mm-hmm. that I had, not saying several weren't real, but I bought so many. Because right. everybody wanted to be part of the Darren Prince gravy train. <laughs> so... So you're continuing on the rise to the top at a very young age. You're using recreationally. How does the sports memorabilia transition into sports and celebrity agent? Okay, so I built, after I sold my baseball card company in 19, I started Prince of Cards, uh, which was part of the division of, of, of the card company. But we started doing autograph signings with mm-hmm. people from Muhammad Ali, Pamela Anderson, Chevy Chase, Smoke and Joe Frazier. Pam was a client for years. Um, and I was, we were crushing it with that. And that was a lot more cool yeah. than baseball cards because now the dumb, broken, shy, unintelligent one that would never go anywhere is hanging out with some of the biggest stars in the world, going to dinners and more validation, more like artificial bullshit that I needed so I could look back and tell people, look at me and look at you. Right. And uh, college dropout. Um, but I had a legal issue with the FBI probably around 94 where there was some fraudulent autographs being sold of Michael Jordan and they were running rampant in the industry. And I got involved unknowingly with some of uh, the wholesalers that were selling it. And there was a big, big investigation. They, um, they cleared my name. Um, I did get charged with making a false statement to the FBI. Mm-hmm. So I have a felony record because I didn't want to divulge any information on my source. I truly believe they were legit. I refunded as much money as possible and literally on the verge of bankruptcy. Wow. And so here you talk about your self-esteem getting shot. How could I make this mistake? Yeah. Like how could this happen? And it, 
my world changed on a fly fishing trip with my dad. I took my last two grand that I had to my name. He didn't want to go. Uh, he wanted me to save my money, but I refused. And we went to Alaska. And on that boat, he said to me, what's your next move? And I said, I want to become an agent. I said, I really think I could do with that, but I don't have eight years to go to law school. And in the most beautiful wilderness in this stream with bald eagles and mooses and everything you can imagine, he drops the fishing pole and says, law school? Why do you need to go to law school? I said, well, don't you need to be a lawyer to be an agent? He goes, I don't know where you got that from. He goes, life is about who you know, not what you know. Mm -hmm. There's not a lawyer on earth that wouldn't kill to have your relationships. You can go to Malibu right now and see Pam and Tommy. You can go to San Francisco and see Joe Montana. You could start to go right down the list, go to Beverly Hills and see Magic. And he goes, I would start with Magic. He's, and everybody stood by your side during this whole FBI thing. And Magic knows about making mistakes. You know, it was a few years removed from his HIV announcement. Right. And tell him your plan. And maybe gives you a shot. And so it was about a month later. Oddly enough... I was in Michigan, where an individual happened to be by the name of Joe Tuttle at this convention through our mutual friend, may he rest in peace, to Dave Bailey. And I booked Magic for his first public autograph signing. Wow. And I had to go to his hotel suite uh, an hour before to kind of catch up with them. And it was almost like a God moment before I knew what a God moment was. He sat me down. He goes, come on, boy, sit down. He goes, how was the fishing trip? How's everything? How are you doing financially? Because he knew I was struggling. And he literally asked me the same question my dad asked. He was like, what's your next move? He goes, you going to go back into the back? I go, no, man. I go, there's so many haters. They hated me when I was on top. Now they're hating. And he's like, said the same thing. He goes, look, God tests great men and women. And he's testing you right now. And you're going to make a lemonade out of lemons. I know it. And uh, he goes, anything I could do to help. I'm so freaking nervous. I'm like, I got to say it. I got to say it. It was one of those moments in life. And I was like, you know, Irvin, I was talking to my dad, and I want to be an agent. And he goes, man, he goes, that's a, that's a big position. He goes, you have any idea who you're looking to sign as clients? And now my heart's just popping out of my chest. <laughs> and it came out, the words. I said, uh, you, you, <laughs> I'd love to be able to start with you. And he came over. And he put his arms on my shoulders and he looked me in the eyes and he goes, you know, you're a good dude. He goes, you made a mistake. And uh, I know what it's like making a mistake in the public eye. I love your family. He goes, here's what I'm going to do. He goes, I'm going to give you two years. But if you don't use me to knock down every door in those two years to build your agency, I'm going to fire you before the term is up because life isn't about how successful I become. It's how successful I make people around me. Mm -hmm. That it's a domino effect and paying it forward. He goes, you understand me? And I said, yes, sir. He goes, get yourself an entertainment lawyer. Let's write something up and let's get to work. And built my entire agency around that man. How amazing. It's so wonderful when you, you, know, you sit down and you talk to people and you listen to their stories and it's like the progression in life. You know, everybody is capable. You have to use the resources around you. Yep. And if you have a talent, you need to push yourself and don't be afraid of failure because yep. people that don't fail never succeed. 100%. Mm -hmm. 100%. Um, Tim Grover, who's Kobe and Michael's trainer, I just booked him and David Goggins and Magic for my boy Vic Tipness uh, mastermind event in June. And he has this saying that if you think the price of winning is high, wait to get the bill for regret. Yep, that's so true. And, and I'd rather fail a hundred times to get that one. Very, I still fail. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have deals go sideways all the time. We have things that we get all, but it, it, it's the it's the mindset of how you deal deal with it, you know, yeah. because. I, I never wanted to be one of those would have, could have, should have guys. You know, every little moment in my life, every little bleep that could have gone the wrong way, you know, led me to this point where, you know, never been happier. And, um, you know, it, that, that man's just been a tremendous blessing, way more than professionally, personally. Mm -hmm. The friendship that we have is just incredible. Yeah, I know. It's very apparent in the way that you live your life and the relationship that you have with your with your clients. It's more than just a mm. agent client relationship. Mm. You guys are really there for each other. I, it's I'm very like apparent. you know, I'm on the phone with Rick Flair telling me he loved me. Hulk Hogan, I'm going to his house Thursday, same thing. You know, I'm texting with Corman, I miss you, babes. You know, just yeah. it it it's more than the business, you know. We get to really be a part of each other's world and know that, you know, hey, they might be blessed with incredible talent and 
Hall of Fame and historical achievements and God-given athletic ability, but we're, we're still people. Right. You know? Well, just the way that they supported you when you when you released the book, you know, I'll never forget that. And I actually, I do want to talk about that, yeah. obviously. So when did that moment happen? We were like, you know what? A lot of crazy stuff has happened in life. <laughs> I've come a long way. <laughs> yeah. I think I'm going to write a book. Yeah. So basically after um, I got sober, when it got, when it got to the end, which... Uh, I'll get into the story, yeah. but my uncle, my, you know, it was another one we lost, my uncle Stu. So I was sick and tired, of sick and tired, but I was too important to go to rehab. My business was booming. And uh, my uncle and his then girlfriend, Andrea, were visiting my mom from Miami in New Jersey, paid me a surprise visit. You know, I was a shell of myself. They walked in. I had no idea they were coming. And she looked at me and said, are you okay? I never met her before. And I was like, I'm not. And I just felt tractor beams. Yeah. Told her everything. And she's like, do you realize that you're an addict and your life's unmanageable? I said, yeah. She goes, you realize you're powerless. And I said, yeah. And she goes, most importantly, do you realize that addiction doesn't discriminate? It doesn't matter if you're from Yale or jail or Park Avenue and Park Bench. And she starts pointing at all the photos in my house, in the office, me and Pam on the set of VIP, sitting ringside at the Tyson fight, all these once-in-a-lifetime opportunities, sitting courtside with Joe and Joe Frazier, Muhammad Ali, center court at the NBA All-Star game. She goes, because... This will still take you to the ground a lot quicker, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 under underground, and that broke my soul and it made me cry. It made me realize that the success doesn't mean anything yep. if I don't mean something. Right. And she goes, "I could help you." She goes, "Do you want help?" I was like, "I'm desperate. I'll do anything." And so she put me on a detox plan for 48 hours and 36 hours. It was July 2nd, 2008, on a Sunday night. I was living in the city. I was married at the time, and I came back from the gym. I'm shaking, upset stomach, cold. Hot flashes constantly happening. I'm just miserable. And I called them up. I said, forget it. I'm calling the goddamn doctor to get what I really need to get. And um, my uncle said, this is the goddamn disease talking. It's time you kick the shit out of this disease, mm -hmm. Darren. I'm sick and tired of dealing with it. You know, Andrea is in recovery, which I didn't know. She was coming up on five years. I'm back in the rooms. You got to get to a freaking meeting and put your hand up and tell these people you're sick and suffering and you need help. And I said, I can't freaking do it. I've been to those dumb meetings because I was arrested in my early 20s. I was, you know, put in one of those programs. Um, a good old court up, order. Yep. <laughs> hung up the phone, wound up uh, running in the bathroom. I was looking for some non narcotic um, anxiety pills to help me that she said I can take and going through all the medicine bottles. And out came two extra strength Vicodin, which, mm. you know, was bizarre because. Me and my ex, Simone, knew that we cleaned out every medicine cabinet to why we these there. And it seemed like such a gift, like exactly what I needed. But, you know, you hear about those white light moments and people have them in life and people have them recovering and some don't. But, but I had one because I fell to my knees and shouted out to God as I'm shaking on the floor crying. Uh, I said, I can't do this. I said, take the money, take the business, take the notoriety. I need a single day of freedom. If you help take me out of hell, I promise I will spend one day at a time helping take others out with me. And it was like a lightning bolt went through my body, uh, from my right shoulder. Uh, it felt like it was on fire. And I heard a voice, I've got you and you're ready. And um, I flushed the pills and stood up and I know it wasn't me. And I'm on the computer. I found a 12-step uh, AA meeting in the upper 80s at a church basement. There's no Uber then, so I run downstairs, my wife, my then wife came with my beautiful summer night of July 2nd. And I started to feel like this almost cleanse. And I looked up at the sky and said, oh, my God. For the first time in my life, I wanted to stay sober. More than I wanted to get high and, um, you know, walk into that church basement with 115, 200 addicts and alcoholics who are once a hopeless state of mind and finally being present in a meeting, not because it was court-ordered. And the leader says... Is there anybody new coming back? Anybody sick and suffering? And I believe it wasn't me that raised my hand. You know, I believe yeah. God put my hand up because my ego is too big. And the words that came out of my mouth is that I'm down, I'm sick, I'm suffering, I'm suicidal, I have an incredible life outside these rooms, but I need help. And it was so real and so raw and so transparent that probably 10, 12 spiritual brothers and sisters I never met came over to me and they told me things I never heard before, you know, stick with the winners. If you want what we have, do what we do. 
don't worry if you don't get the program, you keep coming, the program's going to get you. Mm-hmm. And, and the one that just blew my mind was keep showing up because we're going to love you before you ever learn how to love yourself. And I just became obsessed with meetings. 90 meetings in 90 days, meetings all over the country, all over the world. My sponsor, Steve, who I don't even like using that word because he's my, my big brother, uh, just celebrated 36 years. Wow. Um, he, he said, you got to go to road meetings because you got to come back and tell everybody what happens when people stop going to meetings. Mm-hmm. And um, so I've been to more road meetings around the world, I think, than anybody in the history of this fellowship. I don't say it to impress. I say it to impress upon. I was in Dubai three weeks ago and um, I found right in a hospital I meeting with 30 people and um, it's like the greatest thing in the world to, to be able to experience something like that and I cried some of the guys in there were crying the women were crying just because they get as much joy out of it too mm-hmm. that you could become a part of this extended family where you don't know anybody but you yeah. know everybody and then you know I kind of started getting signs I went through a lot my first I'd say you know, like anyone else, five, ten years of recovery. My dad passed. I lost Joe and Muhammad in recovery, but my dad was the worst. And um, to know they'd had a sober son for eight and a half years, mm-hmm. and to know that I never felt so comfortable during the most uncomfortable time of my life without ever th- thought about picking up was the biggest gift. And he always wanted me to write a book. And um, I didn't want to write about the celebrity life. I was, it's not, I'm not comfortable about that. Right. Like, these are stories, too, that I take to the grave. You know, it's not... It's not something, you know, I want to exploit. And um, met my publisher by chance on Instagram, Anna David. We sat down and talked one day. I was visiting L.A. before I moved there. And she, uh, she goes, you have, like, such passion the way you talk. Mm-hmm. She goes, I, I just, have you ever thought about writing a book? She, and I was like, yeah, my, my, my late father wanted me to do it. And she goes, what's holding you back? And I told her, she goes, people just need to be a fly on the wall of the journey. That's it. Mix in some great stories. Because the bottom line is this will be the biggest thing you ever do for your legacy in your life. And me, her, my writer, Chris McGinnis, took about a month and we came up with the name Aiming High. And the rest was history. That's so amazing. International bestseller in four countries. Never expected it. <laughs> I wrote a book to help a handful of people. To this day, has not slowed down. It just celebrated its four-year anniversary. And people talk on all the biggest podcasts and interviews I do as if it just came out because it's so pressing. Yeah. And... If you look, who wrote the forward? <laughs> Magic Johnson. Yeah. So, and then, you know, the quotes, the support, the social media support. It's like I could do the biggest sports and entertainment marketing deal in history, and I wouldn't get the love and respect and admiration uh, from people in the industry as I would for talking about my journey. But, you know, the, bit, the, the business isn't even what gets me excited anymore. I mean, if I go into my phone, I can show you I got a – a panicking, you know, life and death DM from a woman in uh, British Columbia this morning that saw my interview on Jay Shetty. Uh, and Jay's one of the biggest podcasts in the yeah. world, a dear friend. And, you know, I get two or three of those every week now. That interview is a year and a half old. Wow. You know, and, and I said, I'm sending you a book. Um, she, want, she, she wants to read it. Um, I know a treatment center around that area that I'm putting her in touch with. It, it's... Being there, able to help. There's... There, there's there's nothing better. There's mm-hmm. nothing better. I could lose, I could lose the business and the money tomorrow. Um, it honestly wouldn't change me. I, I would move into a, a studio. The heartbreaking part would be, you know, I couldn't take care of. You know, I've got ten people, two assistants that work for me, and my mom. I take care of my sister, you know, wh- whoever in my life. Um, yeah, I wouldn't be able to go with my girlfriend right. to Dubai in the Maldives, but. <laughs> finally say I'm coming up on 53 next Monday um, I found me Yeah, I found you know self love from the inside and I say I now develop self esteem by doing esteemable acts and to be able to have that and you know and p- the people of Banyan I've got um, you know Bridge Therapeutics that's uh, developing an incredible ground breaking drug that is like Suboxone on steroids because for opiate acts that are listening, this is something that hits your system within minutes versus Suboxone used to take me 20, 30 minutes to peel myself out of bed. And, you know, I get to be on the commercial advisory board and all things that I'm passionate about to just really use my platform to, to help change and save lives from people suffering with mental health and substance abuse issues.
you make it so apparent and obvious that you can have everything. You can have the job. You can have the money. You can have the cars. You can have the clothes. You can have the friends. But if you don't have yourself, you have nothing. Yep. How has life been ever since, you know, you released, well, not even just released the book, but since you've become transparent about your recovery and your addiction struggles, you know, because a lot of people hold on to that and they have this stigma and they think that the life's going to be worse, yep. but I don't believe that. No. And I know you don't either. No. So how's your experience been with that? It's, um, <laughs> it's unbelievable. I never had a single person say, wow, what a piece of crap Darren Prince is because he got sober. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And so I laugh and people say it. I think anybody that's celebrating recovery today, I think it's our obligation. I mean, you know, we all know that the most important principle and step is giving this away to other people. Mm -hmm. And um, I look now and realize the byproduct of my journey was to, to be blessed to be the agent of some of the most culturally iconic um, people of all time. And, and, and I didn't see it. But that was God's way of saying, you're going to make your own choices when you come to me when you're ready. You're going to realize why you're affiliated, you know, to so many of, of the biggest stars in the world. And that's why I can get out on the biggest platforms in the world, yeah. the biggest stages in the world, the biggest movers and shakers, you know, in the world. And, um, you know, my ego wouldn't have understood that. But this is an ego crushing fellowship. And I checked mine a long time ago. Mm -hmm. I did my boy um, Omar the Rockstar's podcast. And he's had Tony Robbins at my leg, Grant Cardone on multiple times. And I told him the truth is, when it's my time, I said, I don't need anything about Prince Mark and my tombstone. I said, if uh, there's one thing that I'd want, it, it's going to save a recovering drug addict that gave this gift away to other people um, one day at a time. Mm -hmm. that's, that's everything to me. I love that you lead forward with that, you know, because it's so true. None of that matters. We need to help people. And also there's just like you said, it's like a responsibility of ours to kind of like recover loud because this world is very different now, you yeah. know, and with the advances in therapy and just the apparent issue of the opioid epidemic, yeah. it's like it's not something you can ignore anymore. Everybody's okay. affected by somebody that struggled. And it's getting worse than ever. Yep. I mean, it's not getting better. They give these numbers sometimes. I mean, that, you know, that's the other thing. Here, here, how does a guy like me wind up in the White House invited by President Trump multiple times um, when he signed the $8 billion opiate initiative bill? Well, I had a relationship with him from Celebrity Apprentice when Dennis Rahman and Brandy Rotter were on there. I did some licensing deals with him. And I remember meeting up with Kellyanne Conway and... Um, um, Chris Christie, who also went to my school in Livingston, Governor Chris Christie. And uh, they were thanking me for the service, mm -hmm. like right outside the Oval Office when the book came out. And, and you know, they same conversation we're having here. We just wish more people would talk about it. Yes. Like you would. It's like it's, to me, it's the greatest thing in all. There's not a corporate business meeting. There's not an ad agency meeting that I could be going in to talk about a huge endorsement or partnership with one of my clients. Well, I don't talk about it because mm -hmm. I guarantee you every single person in that room was affected by this. Yep. Every single person in that room, whether it's a brother, sister, husband, wife, friend, coworker, somebody, you know, there's not a single person that's Im immune to the disease of addiction right now, any sort of substance abuse, alcoholism, or mental health problems. And mental health is so tied in, it doesn't get enough of a focal point yep. to, uh, you know, substance abuse. I fortunately, that was the one big thing when I got sober. I'm like, if I don't have real clinical depression, I can make this. That was mm -hmm. the one thing I kept telling myself. And I know there's people, God bless them, you know, that could take their meds, they stay sober. But they're heroes to me because that part, I don't know how I'd be able to do. I mean, I got a moment, situational depression. I was bored as heck this weekend. My mm -hmm. girlfriend and I hung out Friday night. I left her place Saturday. Watch football Sunday, and I was texting her. I was like, God, I don't know what to do. I'm finally home doing nothing. So just me and my dog Rodney, you know, so you kind of get stuck in your head. But I've learned so many techniques from right. recovery. You know, be of service to somebody else, whether you're stressed, depressed, anxiety, uh, physical pain, not feeling good. Reach out to somebody in your life. It, it doesn't have any. It doesn't have to have anything to do with somebody suffering from addiction or, or mental health. Just somebody going through a rough time. And those little techniques to get out of your own head and get out of your own way 
watch how quick you're not going to remember what that problem is. Yeah. Uh, our mouths, I say it all the time, will get us in the most trouble. Or our texting, our email. <laughs> you know, say what you mean, mean what you say, and don't say it mean. A lot of people don't understand that. If you live that way of life, you'll be a lot better off. You know, I used to be able to be more critical of my team and my staff when a mistake was made. Now I just, you know, I handle it differently. Mm -hmm. I'll build somebody up about the time they did something great and how I made something of a mistake similar to that, and I know they're better, and let's go out now and just make sure we don't do it again. Because it's easy to just tee off on somebody, but now they manifest the rest of their day, all that brilliant wisdom that you gave them to make them feel unmotivated, insecure, not good about themselves. Well, this is all recovery, so right. it's not just about putting the plug in a drug and throwing out the drugs. You know, we learn to be better people. We right. learn to be more spiritual and be more present, most importantly. Um, yeah, again, we're not all perfect at it. You can take yourself into three, four months from what is that going to do? 99% of the things we're going to worry about aren't even going to happen. Oh, yeah, absolutely. The drugs are only a symptom of the problem. Yeah. <laughs> you got to yeah. get to the root of the problem. Yeah. So what advice would you give to someone that is currently struggling right now that's, you know, they're at their wits end, they're at their rock bottom, maybe they're ready to start this journey and they're listening right now? I'd say ask for help. There's people in your life. If you're in school, speak to a guidance counselor or a teacher. Um, if your friends know you're struggling, throw on the towel because the strength is is when you ask and when you surrender. And, um, you know, the one thing I can tell you, and we hear about this all the time, my worst day sober is better than my best, best day I've ever had high. Absolutely. And, and, and to know that, you know, we could all come out of a dark place and the lights can come on. And at any point we can press the reset button and get a brand new lease on life. It, it, it's incredible. You know, you, you just have to put one foot in front of the other, do the right thing, become accountable, um, you know, accept the fact of where you're at and ask for help. You don't ask for help. Um, you're like anybody else that's living in shame of the disease and you're in complete denial. Yep. It, it's, it's not that hard once you, once you come clean to one person just one that, that, that's willing to help guide you or point you in the right direction. The blessings are, are just unbelievable how things start manifesting. You know, you put down that one thing, you can have everything. And don't think that you're going to be doing this alone because if you reach out for help, there are thousands of people. The network, the community and recovery, it's like every single episode that we do, it's, that's what it comes down to. That is the most beautiful part of yep. recovery. It's the community and the people there to lift you up when you're down and be yep. there for you. hundred um, percent. So are you working on anything fun that you want to share with us? Or maybe you just talk about where people can find the book and where anything they can find fun. you? Um, no, I mean, I'm always trying to raise money for my foundation, the Aiming High Foundation, which I think is the Aiming High Foundation dot org. Um, the book, you could the people, anybody can find it on Amazon. I have another business book coming out with my business partner, Kevin Harrington, the Shark Tank judge. I just finished it this morning with nice. the writer. So that's exciting. And um, you know, said that this Bridge Therapeutics project, I'm, I'm super excited about because I was one of those that lived on Suboxone and got addicted to that for a year and a half to be part of a commercial advisory board. And they're in the FDA uh, approval process right now. It'll... It will replace Suboxone, Methadone. It's um, it's just a beautiful thing to have something like that out there now. That through medical science, something was created that you can you know just put something on your tongue, and within a couple minutes, just get on with your day and get off the hard stuff and get into a fellowship, a program, counseling, um, because that's the other problem. People right. flip flop on Suboxone all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you're aware of that, but they'll they'll take that for a month. Ah, no, I'm going to start doing heroin again and. That's, you know, that, 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 that's real hell. You know, oh, cause yeah. I, cause I've been there. I've been there. It's so easy for the addict to continue to manipulate, but no, that's really interesting. I'm looking forward to yeah. following along with that journey and seeing, you know, what comes more out of that medication yep. and hopefully we can help some more people. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. We made it work. We did We got it done in 45 <laughs> minutes. This is perfect. I really appreciate you taking the time to come meet with us. Anything for you guys. You know how special Bannon is to me. Yes. The best. The best in the business. Now I, sound like a, now I sound like one of my celebrities. Nobody does it better than Bannon. Great success rate. Incredible team. And very near and dear to me. And some of the best doctors, counselors, therapists. And... Uh, 
detox program. So this is the spot. 16 locations now. 16 locations. Yep. 16 locations. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Just taking over. That's it. That's <laughs> it. Thanks for having me. Of course. Thank you so much, Darren. And ladies and gentlemen, please go check out his book, Aiming High, like he said, on Amazon, or you can find him on Instagram if you, you know, are looking for help. Agent underscore DP. Well, we hope you enjoyed today's episode. Remember that growth and recovery are possible and it can all start today. Be sure to follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Banyan Treatment Centers and make sure you're subscribing for notifications of new episodes. And please don't forget to leave us a review. If you or someone you know are struggling, call us today at 888-515-7706. Thanks for joining us today on the Banyan Podcast. Podcast.